I like to use the term breathing well technique, if that makes sense, right? And it pretty much means the same thing. It means that if I can establish a proper airway um, and teach a child how to use that airway, then I can see very good facial growth. So, so listen to the way I said it. Many people can give a child a good airway, um, including give them a tracheostomy, you understand? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that airway is going to develop into a lot. We learn how to talk, we learn how to walk, we've actually got to learn how to breathe through our nose. And um, that might sound silly, but if you understand what causes a lot of these malocclusions, it's the fact that the child has a improper tongue posture. So I want everyone just to do this, right? It might sound silly, but I want everyone just to um, close their lips, breathe through their nose and tell me where their tongue is. Just, just do that. Where do you feel your tongue straight away? Hmm? Where exactly? Because the palate's a pretty big place, isn't it? Tip of the tongue is on the palatine rugae. Yep. And that is what causes the development of the premaxilla in children, which is the essential of facial um, beauty. Right? Then I want you to pretend you have a head cold and uh, breathe with your mouth open. Tell me where your tongue goes. So it's not rocket science, is it? Right? So if you have a young child going through major facial growth between four and seven, and they can't breathe through their nose for whatever reason, what do you think is going to happen to the development of their jaw? It's going to become <coughs> underdeveloped. Does that kind of make sense? Right? So you can use someone like David to clear the plumbing. That's important. But then you need to have a team in place to educate that child on how to use their tongue. Does that make sense? And I think that's the missing link. I have a lot of general dentists who do courses and they say, oh, I send that kid to the nose and throat doctor. And they had their tonsils and adenoids removed. Um, and I didn't see any difference. And the mum reports the kid still sleeps with their mouth open. Why? Because for nine years, that kid was sleeping with the mouth open. Um, and this is what needs to change. And this is where that breathing well technique is, is very, very good. Um, the other thing I'd like you to uh, get if you... Who, who's read this book, Your Jaws, Your Life? Just one person. I mean, that's like um, the equivalent of the New Testament as far as I'm concerned. Um, your Jaws, Your Life is a perfect book. It's like $15. It's published by um, a dentist in the States who's dad and granddad and great granddad were dentists and what this guy has done he's basically linked where um, functional jaw orthopedics which is a new way of practicing what we do helps systemic health many of you wouldn't realize that um, um, a child who has airway obstruction has increased chance of nocturnal enuresis or bedwetting has increased chance of middle ear uh, problems, has increased chance um, uh, of noc uh, nocturnal bruxism. How many of you have had a, a patient, a parent, come to you and say, look, I've got Johnny, he's six years old, I know he's probably young for me to bring him in, but we went camping last week and um, Johnny was grinding his teeth all night and no one could, um, could stand to sleep next to him. Who's had a comment like that? And then they ask you, because you're the dentist, you're supposed to know what you're doing, uh, why is Johnny grinding? And I've heard all sorts of stories. Some dentists say, well, the research shows that Johnny's highly stressed. At six, I've heard some people say things like, well, um, Johnny may have intestinal parasites. So, you know, you need to give him combantrin for worming and wait at night with a torch on his ass to see if worms come out. Yeah. <laughs> It's ridiculous. I'll show you, and this book has a whole chapter on it, one of the major causes of children um, having this nocturnal bruxism is poor airway. Does that kind of make sense? Right? Particularly young kids, because they have large adenoids and tonsils to begin with. Um, and if you factor that into um, uh, other concerns, you'll find that what these kids are actually doing, and if you look at these little kids, their wear facets are on their incisors. Does that make sense, right? So all kids should be class two. Let's just start with that. If your kid comes out of the womb like this, you've got big problems, right? 
why are all children, particularly if um, uh, you or your wife uh, don't have a class three job, um, but the milkman does. Yeah. Uh, why are kids all born severely class two? Anyone know? Yeah, why, do, why do all little babies look like something out of Bart Simpson, uh, The Simpsons? Because that's how they suckle on the breast. Their chin kind of gets in the way. Does that make sense? Right? So it's normal to be class two. That's one fallacy that I want to think. You, most kids, particularly boys, only start to grow into class one around about 12 or 13. So the emphasis shouldn't really be on early correction of class two, because nature does that. All right? Um, so the point we're making with these children, the reason they're grinding, if that's the right word, or bruxing or parafunctioning, they're trying to keep their airway open. You know, it's a fight or flight response. Their lower jaw is coming forward. And I can show you 32 papers in peer-reviewed journals that have done that research. How do they do it? They put the kids under a medical sleep study, polysomnography. They have um, EMG measuring uh, activity of muscles. They have oxygen saturation. The moment the kid uh, drops down in their oxygen stats, what starts happening? Temporalis starts working. They start doing this. They're keeping their jaw forward. How many of you, when a parent says, look, my kid's grinding the teeth, say, well, you know what? I think they need an overnight sleep study. I think they need to see an inner and throat doctor. Then you're doing something good for that kid. Second thing is you may want to recommend to that kid to wear one of these trainers. And what will that do? Well, certainly that will prevent wear on their teeth like a splint would for you guys. Secondly, it's going to give them a patent airway. Thirdly, it's going to harness the power of the tongue. Does that make sense? Right? I'll share some stats with you. If you want to move a tooth, which is what I do all day because I'm an orthodontist, um, and it's amazing, you know, no one understands what an orthodontist is. I was flying here, my plane was uh, delayed. Um, I was sitting next to this lady, and uh, you, know, you know when you don't want to talk to people, but people want to start asking you questions? I, I hate that, you know? Um, anyway, she says, oh, so hi, welcome, you know, are you on holiday? And I said, no. And I just thought that would be it, you know? She goes, so what are you here for? And I'm here for a conference. Really? What, what conference? I said, oh, and he came out and I said, I'm an orthodontist. She goes, oh, really? Yeah. You know, I have this lower back pain for years. Yeah. <laughs> so what is an orthodontist? An orthodontist is someone who moves teeth, OK? Um, and to move a tooth using a plate, like a Hawley, uh, I only need about 10 grams of force. If I'm moving a tooth with braces bodily, using newer systems, um, I'm looking at 30 to 40 grams. Using older systems, maybe 200 grams. Do you understand? But the tongue, when you swallow, generates 500 grams. Does that make sense? So what do you think is going to win the war between tooth movement and tongue position? Right? So it's, it's so, so obvious in this regard. But this book, I think, is good for two reasons. One, it really explains to beginners in this field, if this is all new, um, where all this comes from. But number two, and this is what I use it for, every new patient that starts in my office uh, undergoing functional jaw orthopedics, and that might be something as simple as a little kid getting a lingual phrenectomy, seeing an e-nose and throat doctor and wearing a trainer, gets one of these books. And they're my biggest source of referral. So what happens is, the parent reads it, goes, this is amazing, how come no one told me this? They give it to their sister, next thing the cousin comes in and blah, blah, blah. And it's just really, um, I guess it's almost like, um, what's that American technique? Pyramid marketing, like Amway, that, that sort of thing. You know, I don't have a Yellow Pages ad. Um, I, we, we, we get all our referrals word of mouth. And the word of mouth referral is the best referral, particularly if the referral comes from a medical practitioner, okay? Now, um, you know, why is that important? Because when a kid goes to a dentist, um, the first thing the parent wants to know is what? How much is this going to cost? Who would agree with that? When a kid goes to a medical doctor because they're ill, I've never had a parent say, look, my kid's ill, they're not breathing well at night, they're not doing well at school, you know, we think they have attention deficit disorder, um, how much is it going to cost to make them better? So medical referrals are the most powerful referrals. Um, and um, this harnesses that. Because all of a sudden, you go from being a general dentist 
to what I like to call an oral physician, and that's a big leap, right? I know most of you did dentistry because you didn't get the marks in to get into medical school, and I'm sorry for you, you know? Um, but really, you're in a great profession as a dentist, but if you limit your dentistry to drilling and filling, oh, good luck with that. I mean, A, the days of drilling and filling are nearly over. Um, uh, B, you really don't get much job satisfaction. You know, I was never a good general dentist. I did one year of general dentistry because that was the minimum requirement to get into orthodontic school. And I think I did um, one root canal, um, created a few accessory canals, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but, you know, never had parents thank me for um, the third molar that I removed that gave them TMJ or the, you know, root canal that went through the sign. And they never got comments like that. Every day I get letters from parents saying, Dr. Mahoney, you know, remember my daughter, uh, she was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Uh, you said we'd get a sleep study. We did. She had her tonsils and adenoids removed. Now she's a top of her class. We just want to thank you very much because um, last year she got into medical school. And that's, that's a true letter. You know, it's really rewarding what we're doing. So I'd like you today to pretend you got enough marks to get into medical school. How does that sound? Yeah? I want you to...